Heaven will not remember who made a MacBook. Just like you don't care who made a cassette. Do you care who made a floppy disk? Why do you laugh when it was only made a few decades ago? Our technology switches in the speed of light. The toothbrush that you know, it was only invented 1938. Just a hundred years, the world we're living today didn't even exist. Which means in the next a hundred years, things that are valuable today will be completely trashy. And skip that to a few hundred more years and the things that you fight and I aim for will become completely meaningless. And if we go to just a few more thousand years, the things that we value today and even some people that we value above God, all of that completely becomes completely nothing. Some of you don't remember the first girlfriend that you had when you were in middle school. You don't remember her name. But you lost sleep over her, you missed school over her, and you missed God because of her. But see, that's kind of what happens with us, is when we get stuck in a certain season of our life, we put it things above God, and next thing we don't realize, time shows one thing. What really matters in the long term is the things we do for God. Everything else is really secondary. The Bible says there will be two judgments after we die. One judgment is the judgment of Christ. The judgment of Christ is where Jesus will judge only Christians. You say, oh, it's about time they get judged. I agree. And Jesus will judge them. And I'm so happy Jesus will judge us, not other Christians. Jesus will judge us. But this judgment will determine not whether we go to heaven or hell. This judgment will determine where in heaven we will live. This judgment, well, not exactly. All you Bible theologians, not exactly. This judgment will determine what reward in heaven we will have. This judgment will determine as Christians whether we're going to live in, in a ghetto or we're going to live in a palace. This judgment will determine, it will look at our whole life, what we did for God or what we did not for God and determine whether we lived for heaven or we just lived for ourselves and used God as an insurance card or used God just as a spare tire and used that right before we died like many people like to prefer. Do you think it's fair for Jesus who's dying on the cross who lived 33 years serving people, living every day for people, dying for people to have the same reward as a man who lived 33 years stealing from people and dying because he stole from people? You think the same should get the same reward? No, they'll both go to the same heaven. One will have the name above every other name and another man will be in heaven. That's it. You may say, that's not fair. In the Bible it says, at the judgment seat of Christ, God will take your whole life as a Christian. Not to judge you to say you're a bad person. But to say, I want to give you a reward. And he will put a lighting match to it. It means whatever was not done for him will just go into ashes. Now it's not going to be bad for you. You're not going to go to hell. But you're not going to be rewarded for that. And so our aim today is to live our life in such a way that when we get to heaven, we have also something there that's waiting for us. The second judgment is the judgment of white throne and this judgment is a very very bad judgment. This judgment is only for people who are going to hell and this judgment will be explaining why. Actually Satan will stand at this judgment. Hades, death, death is not just a physical occurrence, it's actually like an entity. It will stand there. It's, it's going to be a crazy crazy thing. I'm, my, I'm Pretty sure we're going to get a DVD of that but in heaven. But it's going to be a really crazy thing. And then everything's going to be thrown to the lake of fire. But we're going to go to the first judgment. And this first judgment will do that for us. I heard a story of one guy who, two guys actually, who died. And they went to heaven. And St. Peter welcomed the first man. He was a uh, businessman. He was a Christian man. He was a very wealthy man but very stingy. Like he always hated the church, talking about money. The church wanted to get his money. So he just did not like to give his money, did not like to help because he thought he was a self-made businessman. He shouldn't share it with no one. The other man was a missionary 
who lived his life giving everything away and serving people and say, seeing people get saved. So the missionary gets this amazing mention. The businessman is like, man, if the missionary was poor on earth, he got this. I cannot wait. What am I going to get? And then they come to the shack. And St. Peter's like, this is your dwelling, Mr. Businessman. He said, what do you mean the shack? I was a businessman. I had a nice car there. He said, I'm so sorry. That's all we could build with the material you sent. You know what that means? Every dollar you give to the kingdom of God, every person you send, you can invite to church. Every time you come for a night prayer and you pray for souls. Every time you wake up in the morning and you pray for the things that we pray for. Every time this vision is not just ah, but it goes inside of you. Anytime your life regains a direction for the things of eternity. You're not just making your life better here. You're sending things on there where you will live not 200, not 300, not 500, but according to Jesus, since he died and rose from the dead, I'll take his word for it forever. Forever. Some people say, what if eternity doesn't exist? You lose nothing but drugs, alcohol, and sexual transmitted diseases. Depression, fear, and anxiety. Demonic oppression and so many other things. But if eternity doesn't exist, then God doesn't exist. If God doesn't exist, then we don't exist. How do I know that God exists? Because we exist. Every painting is a proof there is a painter. A creation is a proof there is a creator. Some eight years ago, there was a young man. I do not know how I came in contact with him. I was trying to think of it today. His name was Caesar. And I usually don't mention people's names without their permission, but you will find out why. Uh, I met him and uh, I took him into my house to spend the night there. I was maybe 16 or 17 years of age. I lived with my parents, had my own room. And what happened is this man was in a maximum security prison a few times. He had big scars where he was um, cut, uh, beaten, abused, things that were done to him. Um, there are some things I can't even mention here because of the children and so and he mentioned to me and he was actually one of the big um, guys who worked with the drug cartel uh, there in Mexico. He told me of the things that he had in Hawaii and other places and and here he was here somehow he got dropped here and he was waiting for some more transportation and I was trying to bring him to Jesus while I hosted him in my house. Not a good idea. He slept on my floor while I slept on the bed. I prayed prayers sincerely every night because I'm like, if some demon enters this guy, I'm going to be dead meat in the morning. I remember I would bring him to church. Sometimes he would escape from church and I find him in the East Pass calling me because he got either beaten, drunk, or some other trouble where he would be running from some other gangs and I would have to pick him up. And I got myself almost into some trouble trying to help this kid. He was a little bit older than me. And for about a few months, I was praying earnestly. I didn't want anything from him. I just wanted his soul to be saved. And he was telling me how he loves the women and how he has these women waiting for him and he has this big empire you know that once he goes back to Mexico he's going to be the main you know drug cartel and everything's going to be so awesome and and one of I think it was a Friday night some big red truck pulled over to the church parking lot and he walked out and he got into the truck and I remember I ran behind the truck and I said don't go because he won't come back he said, no, I got you, bro. I'm going to send you some money. You're going to pay off your, this, this church. You're going to pay off your house, man. I'm going to make you rich, bro. That's exactly what he was saying. And yeah, he took me for an idiot. That means who I am. Toyota Corolla, old car. I don't even know my accent. Three months later, I got a news that during the drug cartel negotiation, he got shot. It's eight years past. I'm alive. My life is better because of God. And it's been eight years. If Jesus is real, he's burning in hell. If I am wrong, I lose nothing. But if Jesus is right and we don't serve God, we lose everything. 
I'm not just talking about giving your life to Jesus. That's the least thing we can do. I'm just asking us today to be like Joseph who sets a dream so high but also lives to see people saved. Not everyone can invite 20 people at the service but someone can pray for 20 people to come. Someone can miss a breakfast in the morning and lock himself in a room and say, God save my generation. This is not so people can become Christians. This is so people can find life. It's the people who have 20 pills in their bathroom because their life is falling apart and they want to end it to find hope. It's for people who are maybe locked in a mental institution who are hearing voices and hallucinating and there is no drug that can help them. They can find peace that passes understanding. It's the families that are falling apart that can find hope. It's the drug addict who's been hooked on drugs that cannot stop can find hope. And you and I can be the Joseph. And God says, if you help them, God says, I will make an eternity to celebrate your legacy. And I will make this life on earth more meaningful than you can ever imagine. And I say, yes, Lord. What do you say?